Okay, so um, <clears throat> here's what we were talking about last time. We are talking about flux. It's been a while. Uh, so we had an exam and a weekend. Uh, so it was uh, four days ago, I guess. Um, anyway, we were talking about flux. And the idea of flux is that we're, uh, very importantly, no longer thinking of the vector field as representing forces. Right? Now, total change. We're thinking about the vector field as representing the flow of a fluid. Right? And if this vector field represents the flow of a fluid, then you could reasonably ask the question, okay, um, here's a piece of surface. How much of this fluid is actually flowing through the surface? I mean, volume per unit time. Give me, you know, how many cubic feet per second or uh, what have you are going through this surface? Okay. Now, in order to make that question precise, um, I mean, certainly there's something very different about, you know, if the fluid is going this way versus if the fluid is going, I mean, what if the fluid were going the other way, right? I mean, there's something really different about that. Is it the same flux each way? Come on, there's, there's clearly there's something, one's kind of the negative of the other. Okay, so which one's positive? And we define what we mean by positive flux uh, by uh, in defining the surface, we give a, a, a unit normal vector that describes what we call an orientation on the surface. So that's what we're going to call the positive direction uh, through the surface. And with that in mind, if that's the positive direction, and I appeal to your geometric intuition, this fluid here, there is a positive, as drawn here, a positive flux of this fluid through that surface because it's all going through, you know, somewhat askew, but mostly it's going uh, in the direction of that orientation. It's not going opposite the direction of the orientation. Okay. All right. So that was our setup, and uh, we uh, wrote down some formulas and uh, came down to these um, <coughs> these uh, results of, uh, you know, how to write this down, uh, and that is, uh, it's a Riemann sum, for one thing, right? And... The uh, resulting formulas in integral notation uh, are sort of most immediately that one, right? And then I made this observation, and I think this is good to keep track of this kind of thing. DS refers to something about the domain. It refers to the size of the domain. And the thing about it is, so does this normal vector. That normal vector also is talking about something that's intrinsically about the domain. Which way is the correct direction through that domain uh, as opposed to the alternative? And so since both of these are part of the domain, I like to group these together. And it's not just me, by the way. But I like that these are sometimes grouped, grouped together. Uh, and the notation is to call that uh, the DS vector. Um, because its uh, its magnitude is the ds scalar, but it's a vector. Okay, so uh, that uh, notation allows us to write flux like this. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so that's where we left off. Um, and by the way, another reason that I like this notation, I mean, it's compact. That's nice. I'm all about compactness. That's convenient. Right? Um, <coughs> But another nice thing about it is this is a visual cue. It's a visual reminder looking right at you right there as the differential that this is not a scalar surface integral. right? And if you use this old notation right here, kind of at a glance, you look at that differential, and it's tempting to say, oh, yeah, uh, over a surface we have a scalar differential. Um, this looks like a scalar surface integral. And, you know, you could make your case in such, there's a point of view there, but I think it's more natural to concede that this is a fundamentally different kind of construction. Um, and uh, as such, I think it's good that it look different also as notation. Alrighty. Okay, so how do we compute these things? Right? This is the problem we always face every time we write down a new kind of Riemann sum. Right? How do you, how do we, I need a number, right? I need an answer. Um, here is what we have so far in terms of uh, you know construction that we've set up. Um, we've talked about if you parameterize. Uh, keep in mind, by the way, we're always going to be parameterizing the surface, and we'll come talk about the details of this picture in a few minutes. But we're always parameterizing, and on the parameterized side, here's what we've got. Uh, we have uh, there's a little piece of area here, uh, ds, 
and we talked about these edge vectors x u d u and x v d v and uh, these came from uh, understanding this capital N vector all of this we defined several sections back when we're talking about scalar surface integrals all I've done now is I've introduced two new players the unit normal vector defining the orientation of the surface right let me erase all the rest of this junk uh, the unit normal vector and this ds vector this differential ds vector okay all right so these are our players in the game and here's what we're trying to compute uh, this thing uh, right here integral uh, f dot ds. Uh, I want to focus my attention on the ds vector itself. Well, can we you know, can we rewrite that ds vector? And it turns out, by the way, just like with vector line integrals, you remember how with vector line integrals, we were, how do we compute vector line integrals? And we realized we already have everything we need. It's just a matter of writing it down. It's there. It is. It's already looking at us. We are actually again in a situation where we already have everything we need to understand the ds vector. The ds vector we defined as being um, in ds. That's our definition of it. And uh, let's not forget we have formulas for the ds scalar. The ds scalar, again, from several lectures back, is capital N's magnitude times du dv. That's how you pull back the ds scalar. So you pull back area. Right. And now, check it out. Move parentheses around. If I uh, just kind of do like this with the parentheses instead, thus giving me this to look at inside parentheses, what can I say about this product? Little n times the magnitude of capital N. This vector is pointing in the same direction as capital N because it's a normal vector. It's pointing in the same way as capital N. Its magnitude is the magnitude of capital N. This has the same direction as capital N. It has the same magnitude as capital N. It's capital N. And so we're done. Check it out. Right? Our for, there's our formula for the ds vector. The ds vector is capital N du dv. And again, we didn't have to set up any new machinery. It's all there. We just had to observe what we already had. Okay. Um, right. So if you want to compute a vector surface integral, uh, oops, here's your pullback formula through your parameterization. Okay. All right. Um, it's very pluggy chuggy from here. Pretty much, so there's one sticking point that uh, we need to talk about, but it's largely pluggy chuggy. So, for example, um, let's suppose I'm interested in the following surface. We're looking at a surface. Um, notice that this surface is a graph, by the way, right? So, we want to look at this surface. We want to look at the part that is sitting uh, above the unit disk in the xy plane. Uh, and we've got this additional information given that says uh, oriented downward. We'll come back and think about that in a minute. Uh, so for right now, let's just try to parameterize this surface that has that equation and specifically the part that's above the unit disk in the xy plane. Uh, so no problem. Paraboloid, chapter 2. Right. Um, here's a picture of that paraboloid. Uh, being as it is a graph, I'm going to use the graph parameterization. To parameterize it, right? X and U, excuse me, X and Y um, in the graph parameterization. X and Y are U and V, right? So the domain, the pullback domain in the UV plane, that's uh, going to be the same as well. The what is the range of values uh, in the XY plane? Same thing. Um, the formula for the graph parameterization, uh, let's see, oh, uh, where did I put it? Uh, here we go. Formula for the graph parameterization is uh, right there. Unfortunate line wrap, sorry about that. Uh, but uh, there's our parameterization, and there's, there's temptation to just uh, start going, just, you know, plug in, you got your parameterization, compute what you need to compute. Here's the, uh, the formula, I need to compute uh, capital N. 
That's XU cross XV. Start taking partial derivatives cross products. Notice, celebrate, you don't have to take a magnitude. We're not looking for the magnitude of capital N. Don't care about the magnitude of capital N. Just capital N itself. And then a dot product, which again is easy. Okay, so you can see how these are very largely pluggy chuggy. Okay, here's the sticking point, the, the, the weird thing. Um, it's about orientations. So notice it said here, uh, oriented downward, right? And I parametrized it, but I didn't, at the time that I was parametrizing, give any immediate thought as to whether I'd parametrized this the right way or the wrong way. We don't even think about that with surfaces. We don't think about, well, which direction is it going, right? We totally think about that with curves, though, right? So, uh, for example, if I give you a curve and say, uh, yeah, curve is oriented this way, you wouldn't parametrize it this way. That's parametrizing it backwards. You can see that when you parametrize. When you parametrize something, when you parametrize a curve, right? The, the, the metaphor that we have for a parametrization is that T is time. And the progress of time traces you through the parametrization. You can see the direction right there in how you make a parametrization of a curve. And just as you parametrize it, don't parametrize it backwards. Right? Okay. We simply don't have a convenient way to look and see when we write down a parameterization, you first write this down, at a glance to tell which direction did I parameterize this. It just doesn't leap off the page. Right? So that's why we tend not to notice. Um, but again, it's very important. You gotta parameterize this the right way. Now let's, let's think about where we're at. Um, the, uh, the statement of the question says, uh, that this surface um, this surface here is oriented downward. That means, looking at this picture up here, the question I have been asked is, yes, it's about this surface with the understanding that I want to be oriented in the two possible ways that I could be oriented. The one that's kind of, you know, pointing down-ish as opposed to up-ish. So if that's the direction I want my normal vectors to point. Did it? Let's look back at what we did. I wrote down this parameterization. Parameterized as the surface. No thought being given at all to the direction. Um, compute that normal vector, though, from that formula. And uh, there's the capital N vector that I've computed. And take a look at that third coordinate. That third coordinate is positive. That means that I have inadvertently parameterized upward not downward. I accidentally parameterized this thing the wrong way. Does everybody see the problem there? And again, you know, it, this, this problem doesn't come up when you're parameterizing curves because it's obvious with curves. Here, it's hidden. It doesn't reveal itself until you're already kind of partway through the calculation and uh, only after having done all this work do I realize, uh-oh, I parameterized the wrong way. Okay, all right, so... There's a temptation to say, oh my gosh, am I going to have to start all over? Do I have to erase that whole parameterization and start from the beginning? Um, and good news, no, we don't have to start all over. All we have to do is recognize here um, uh, that we've parameterized um, the wrong way backwards, however you want to say it, right? You can focus the attention on that which makes it clear that I have accidentally parameterized this thing the wrong way. Um, and knowing that you've parameterized it the wrong way, you're simply going to compute the flux inadvertently. You're going to compute the flux that's the exact negative of the flux that you want to compute. And you can fix it by just sticking in a minus sign and proceeding along as exactly as if you um, had uh, not had this problem in the first place. So it's an easy fix, right? Very good news that it's an easy fix. However, if you ignore this point, right, if you just proceed, if you take a literally pluggy-chuggy view on this and just, you know, capital N uh, is uh, XU cross XV orientations, uh, you know, aside, 
then you're going to get wrong answers, and they're importantly wrong. Right, so this is a this is a big conceptual point. It is something that's going to count a lot on exams. If you inadvertently parameterize it backwards, oh, let me say this this way: you are responsible for making sure that you have parameterized the correct way. Okay. So be careful. Um, and again, easy to fix. What I've written here in purple: uh, this is a perfectly sufficient, plenty of discussion uh, noting the backwardness of the parameterization. All right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so do we all need to look well, yeah, so that, that's a great question. Thank you. That segues very nicely into the next thing I want to talk about, which is um, uh, different ways uh, that this can manifest. So uh, let's look at this surface here. Uh, let me draw a quick picture of what the two different possible orientations are. Uh, this is uh, one possible orientation. Keep in mind an orientation is a collection of normal vectors telling you uh, at any given point on the surface which way is the you know correct direction through the surface. So there is what you might call one orientation on the surface. Right? Now let me draw the other orientation. The other orientation. Oh, whoops, sorry. Every so often my thing just goes weird. So these blue arrows that I've drawn here, these blue vectors, uh, indicate a consistent well-defined direction perpendicular through the surface. And so do the green vectors, right? So there's always two, exactly two, if the surface is not something weird like a Mobius strip, right? Um, but uh, um, for nice surfaces, um, there's two choices as to what your orientation is, right? So the way we distinguish one orientation from the other is I, I'm not going to actually write down formulas for all of these, it's too much, it's too inconvenient, it's too bulky, right? And then likewise, you know, for the green vectors, I'm not going to write down explicit formulas for what all of those green vectors are out of the question, right? So what we tend to do is we tend to look at a uh, convenient shared characteristic, a distinguishing characteristic that, uh, you know, between the two different options, even if it's not perfect, Right? And that one shared distinguishing characteristic, uh, we use that to, to, uh, to talk. So here, with the, the blue vectors and the green vectors, well, they, there's a lot to say about how they point. But one thing you got to give me, all the blue vectors point kind of up-ish. And all the green vectors point kind of down-ish. Right? So in this case, for this particular surface, a very reasonable way to distinguish orientations is by, yeah, by, as you said, looking at the third coordinate and in other words, we have an up orientation, we have a down orientation, and it's 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 a uh, not uh, a perfect description of the orientations, but it is distinguishing. Okay. So on the other hand, here's another example of a surface. Your surface uh, could look like um, this. It could be a sphere, and there the two orientations look pretty different. There's what you might call uh, this orientation, and then there's what you might call that orientation. Now, it, can you can we distinguish these orientations by talking about well, one of them's up and one of them's down? And no, not at all. Right? This blue orient this blue orientation. Some of the vectors point down. Some of the vectors point up. Likewise with the green orientation. Some are down, some are up. So, so this complicated scenario is different from that previous complicated scenario in that the distinguishing characteristics are different. Yeah. So here, what I would suggest in this case is uh, we would uh, describe these orientations by inward versus outward. Right? You see how that distinguishes... Right, it's a simple yet distinguishing characteristic. How would you tell geometrically? You'd have to look at the vectors. You'd have to think about for a given vector. Okay, at this point there, you'd have to look at the actual vector defined at that point and ask, is it this one or is it the? Is it pointing toward the origin, or uh, is it pointing away from the origin? Um, and uh, so it's going to be a different algebraic um, sort of twist, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. 
Okay, uh, other than uh, this minus sign, again, that comes from the orientation being backwards. Uh, everything else is pluggy chuggy. We have a uh, formula for the normal vector. It's xu cross xv, crank it out. Just algebra. Um, the, uh, we plug the parameterization into the vector field. There's our parameterization. Plug that into the vector field. The vector field was convenient. The vector field was just uh, uh, f of x, y, z is x, y, z. And uh, compute, 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 and we get that integral. Now, uh, reminder, what is the domain for this integral? This integral is the pullback integral. Right? We started off with an integral defined on this surface and then we pulled back through the parameterization to get an integral on our pullback domain. We've already discussed that. That's the unit disk in the UV plane. Um, and uh, so, you know, again, if you are wondering, you know, when you rewrite your integral, don't forget that this is the pullback uh, integral. So pullback domain. Okay. And uh, by the way, in this case, uh, you'll notice that this being round is a candidate for doing polar coordinates. This also looks nice in polar coordinates. Um, and so uh, easy computation. Okay. All right. Um, it's another example there. I'm going to let you all read. Um, this one I think is worth discussing. Um, here we have uh, a sphere oriented outward. There's that terminology, outward versus inward. And um, here's a vector field, and how are we going to compute this uh, this flux? Um, so uh, we could brute force this. You could parameterize your sphere. How are we going to parameterize a sphere? Uh, ooh, I suggest you use spherical coordinates. Right? Use the use the spherical graph parameterization. I'll refer you back to chapter two, where we had a discussion about that. So the spherical graph parameterization. The bad news with the spherical graph parameterization is there's sines and cosines all over the place. Um, which means that there's going to be sines and cosines all over the place in your vector field. And, of course, there's going to be sines and cosines all over the place in your capital N vector. Not that this can't be done, right? But it's, oh, man, it, we would get some pretty rough-looking integrals if we were to proceed brute force down this particular path. Okay. So, you know, that's an option. Uh, I want to draw your attention to the fact that spheres are uh, extremely symmetric. There's lots of wonderful symmetries on spheres. And what we're going to capitalize on in this case, yeah, here we go, is uh, spheres have this feature um, that their outward normal vector, this is a geometric appeal, their outward normal vector is always a scalar multiple of the position vector wherever, for whatever point you happen to be at on the sphere. That is a unique characteristic of spheres. And, and super convenient. I mean, wow, I didn't have to parameterize anything. And I already know my unit normal vector. Now, I don't have a parameterized normal vector. I can't plug into capital F dot capital N DUDV and plug and chug, right? This is just a unit normal vector. No pullback available, but knowing that unit normal vector can be really useful sometimes. Okay, so um, by the way, uh, this was a sphere of radius uh, three, and since that is radius three, I know that these vectors, the position vectors, um, have magnitude 3, and this vector is parallel but has magnitude 1, so it's just one-third of that position vector. Okay, so does that help us? Um, yeah, it turns out that it does. And in fact, if you just go straight to the, you know, sort of the... Uh, the first formula that we ever wrote down for flux, there it is. And you just notice that this normal vector, oh gosh, I've already forgotten what color I used, purple. Uh, this normal vector right here, easy formula that I have for it, the vector field, like there, if you take vector field dot 
normal vector, just like the formula says, um, check it out, you get that that dot product is zero. That's just how the algebra works. Lucky break, right? So sometimes the stars align and life is good. And uh, you'd be surprised how often stuff like this happens. Again, I've made this observation before. You know, in my in my uh, you know past life as a second major in physics, I did a bazillion integrals and sizable fraction. Cool stuff like this happens. It's kind of like with symmetry. All right, so heads up. Always be on the lookout for that. Um, okay, so I want to talk about, uh, uh, very quickly before we go on to the next thing, a comparison between line integrals and surface integrals. Um, this uh, is not obvious. Um, it is, um, let's see, do I want to do it like that? Here, let me do it like this instead. Pencil, here we go. It's uh, not obvious at all that this will work. But it turns out there's a strong analogy between line integrals and uh, surface integrals. Uh, vector line integrals and vector surface integrals. And before I get into what the analogy is, I want to point out, just to let you know, why there's an analogy there. And it's because, believe it or not, despite the fact that vector line integrals are about work and uh, vector surface integrals are about flux, Vector line integrals are, we think of them about being a computation of work, right? We think of vector surface integrals as being about a computation of, you know, in the context of fluid flows, right? Totally different physics. Um, the reason that they that they're, the analogy I'm about to show you exists is because mathematically it turns out they're kind of the same thing. These are both examples of what we call integrals of differential forms. And I am not going to tell you what a differential form is or what an integral of a differential form is because it's beyond what we could reasonably do in this class. It's lofty, sophisticated stuff. Right. Um, but in fact, if you look at differential forms and say, what would an integral of a differential form look like in this context and what would it look like in that context? It'd be vector line integrals and vector surface integrals. Right. So the analogy exists because they're the same thing. Just in a way that I, sorry, I can't, we can't do the details. Okay. Uh, so anyway, I wanted y'all to be aware of that. Now, uh, the, the, uh, the way that that manifests itself, again, let's, um, draw a line here. Um, uh, the, uh, the way this manifests itself is, um, just in how things proceed along in highly analogous ways. Um, both cases, we're doing a parameterization. Forgive me for drawing the parameterizations vertically, in, you know, instead of horizontally. But the paper is just not wide enough, All right? So, a little awkward. But oh well. Okay. Um, in both cases, we have a derivative. Now, with the parametric curve, the derivative is the velocity vector. But I'm going to write x prime. Uh, in this case, it's I'm going to call capital N a derivative. And if you think about it, what is capital N? It's xu cross xv, and xu and xv are literally derivatives. They're, okay, so, it's, so we're looking at a cross product of derivatives. But I'm going to call it a derivative because it's a derivative after a fashion. Okay. Uh, let's see here. In both cases, there is a corresponding uh, unit vector. And uh, defining which way we're going or what's the correct direction on that geometric object. Uh, in both cases, there is a um, uh, an area, excuse me, a size. So uh, size on the curve is a length. Size on a surface is a piece of area. Right. And in both cases, there is the single vector, the vector differential dx for um, for line integrals, uh, ds for surface integrals, and in both cases, that single vector differential tells you everything you want to know about that piece of surface. The dx vector points in the direction that the curve is going and has magnitude equal to the size of that piece that you're looking at. ds points in the direction of the orientation and has magnitude equal to the area of that piece of 
surface. Okay. All right. Um, and in both cases, there's a uh, a, a pullback. It's uh, oh, hang on. Uh, the pullback is uh, you know dt when we're doing vector line integrals, and it's du dv when we're doing vector surface integrals. Okay, so I've color coded what the analogy is, and uh, I want to just point out in how I write this down how the analogy uh, shows up in the algebra. Oh gosh, and I'm not going to be able to get this all on the same page. Okay, so uh, okay, let me go back to this. Um, here's how the algebra works out. Let's look at our vector vector differentials. And I want to keep this color coded if I can. Our vector differentials are uh, derivatives times pullback sizes. Right? Derivatives times the pullback sizes. Yellow times orange in both cases. How about that? Um, it's, oh god, colors. Um, you, um, unit vectors times sizes in both cases. Unit vector, green times blue, unit vectors times sizes. And the analogies just continue. It's going to take a while to write all this down, so let me just point um, and say, but uh, this is analogous to that. All right? So the layout of the players how the players relate to each other in vector line integrals and vector surface integrals, totally analogous. It's the same thing, different context. And I think that's a real eye-opener. Um, so, uh, uh, by the way, the analogy continues uh, when you start writing down the integrals. Here are the different forms that you can write down integrals. Right? There is a uh, form of work integrals compared to flux integrals where we use the, uh, the vector differential. Right? There's a form where you write it parameterized in terms of the derivative, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? The analogies continue. Okay. So the reason I show you this is I think this is uh, for one thing it's just cool that I mean little mathematical cultural observation that hey check it out these two things that look totally different are actually really, really similar. And that's a, that's a sophisticated cultural point that I think it's just good to be aware of. Um, but uh, from a computational standpoint, this is useful because if you find yourself kind of trying to figure out, like, what is the deal with the... Um, I, I don't really understand the capital N vector. How do I think about the capital N vector? What role does capital N play in vector surface integrals? Just think about the analogy. Think, well, it plays a role that's highly analogous to the derivative, x prime, which I perhaps you totally already get. Right? So knowing what to compare to gives you an opportunity to get a better understanding of things that maybe you're not quite confident on yet. So I hope you'll take advantage of that uh, that opportunity. Okay. Uh, oh, that's fine. Okay. All right. So uh, this last section, flux through a curve, it's very very analogous to flux through a surface. It's just a two dimensional version. Instead of talking about water flowing in three dimensions through a surface, imagine water flowing on a plane. Which, by the way is kind of how water flows on the surface of the earth, right? So fluid flowing on a surface is highly analogous. And you could talk about how much water is passing over a certain curve, right? So flux through a curve, totally analogous thing. I'm going to let you all read uh, this. We just don't have time. And, and again, I'll remind you that we, I'm, we always have to make tough decisions about what can I spend time on in class. We don't have enough minutes. This is something I think is a good choice for you all to read on your own. It's very short and very analogous. Okay, so <clears throat> this last thing I'm going to tell you about new kinds of integrals, coordinate line integrals and coordinate surface integrals, is largely just notation. So I am going to go pretty quickly through this. Um, I wish I had more time. Math 212 just has so much material in it. We have to make these tough choices. Okay. So um, here's um, what we've done 
Previously, we've talked about vector line integrals. dx is x prime dt. Old news. Nothing new there. Uh, let me just make the observation. Uh, here's something we've not quite ever gotten around to. We've never quite gotten around to looking at that x prime vector and writing it in coordinates. Now, why have we not gotten around to that? Because it's easy, and why would we? Pretty reasonable answer, right? What's the point of looking at this? When needed, yay, write out the coordinates, do the dot product. I mean, this dot product is an easy thing to write down. We just don't need to write it out in coordinates. Y'all can see that coming. Okay. But something weird happens if you do. If you write out x prime in coordinates, right? And then you look at this thing, dx, x prime dt, right? What you notice is that each one of the resulting coordinates in here uh, we have, for example, dx dt times dt. You sort of note, hey, the, check it out. That's like those things cancel. And how about I could just call this dx. Seems like a reasonable thing to want to do. Um, and then we look up at the picture and we think, hey, well, sure, yeah, because as you move along the curve, if you move along this piece of curve, all the coordinates are changing, and what we just called dx represents how much that x coordinate changed. And d something is how we represent things changing, right? So this everything's lining up, everything looks good. And um, now let me just observe that this gives us a new notation for vector line integrals. We now have a coordinate notation for our dx vector. So let's just, let's literally now just do that dot product. Let's take F, PQR, and let's dot it out with this dx vector, dx, dy, dz. And this is what happens. The vector field dot the dx vector. Now we have in coordinates as dx, dy, dz. And it suggests that I could rewrite that vector line integral like this. Okay, so this is uh, these are what I'm going to call coordinate line integrals. Um, and the very first question you'll want to ask is, why would we ever want to do that? Right? Look how clunky that notation is. Right? I mean, who would rather write down that than this? <laughs> Here's another thing I don't like about it. Um, this notation here is is physical, right? This notation you can see, yeah, the vector field represents forces. The dx represents displacements. I can see the work calculation force dot displacement right there in that notation, right? Um, what does this mean physically? And the answer is nothing particularly obvious. Right, you can force it. You, I mean, you can you can cram a meaning into it if you really want to, but it's not a very natural something that you can write down physically. Okay. Um, nevertheless, this is a notation you can use, and you'd be surprised. This notation is in I don't want to say routine use, but it's certainly not unusual. This notation's out there. Uh, I've I've seen it in physics books. I've seen it in engineering books. So part of the reason I'm showing you this is because you're going to see this notation out there. People are going to write this. They're going to say work equals, and they're going to write out three integrals that look like that. Heads up. Um, it'd be really easy to oops on this and to say, oh, look at this. I, I have an integral dx. Hey, this is single variable calculus. Very importantly, no, it's not. Right? This is not single variable calculus. Don't lose sight of the fact this is happening over a curve, right? So it's, it's such a weird construction. We're moving along a curve, but our differential, it's not the length of the curve. It's not the displacement along the curve. My differential is, yeah, how much did X change? It's it, Geometrically and physically, this is an odd thing. Anyway, don't make the mistake of thinking of it as being a single variable, um, uh, you know, a calc one kind of an integral. Okay, I do want to recognize, by the way, there is another nice thing about 
this, and that is that uh, you remember what I was saying a minute ago about how um, vector line integrals. This is what differential forms look like in the context of you know on a curve in space. That's what an integral of a differential form is. Well, if I was going to show you what differential forms actually look like, they look like this. All right, so uh, this is a uh, a toe in the water toward a very deep conversation again that we can't possibly do. Right, so I, I, I guess I want to say it. Um, so let me say it a little bit differently. When you write down vector line integrals like this, there are great reasons to want to do this. It's just that they're not great reasons that we can make sense out of in this context. Okay. So um, in your future, when you see this notation, what I suggest is that you think to yourself, oh, okay, uh, all right, they're writing it that way. Okay, fine. But make sure you realize that this is what they're actually talking about. Right? So these things here, the, the, the integrands of these three coordinate line integrals, those integrands are just in a weird way telling you what your vector field is for your vector line integral. Right? And these differentials, uh, dx, dy, dz, they're, okay, right, so they're breaking up what I sh would rather think of as my dx vector in my vector line. Okay. All right. Okay. So here's the thing. Uh, oh, so definition going forward. dx, x prime dt, just like we wrote back on the previous page. And so these are... These are the definitions of uh, these three coordinate line integrals. Okay, you can do the same things for surfaces. And again, we never got around to this, and why would we have? Um, but uh, let's look again at our derivative. Right? There's that derivative, the n vector, capital N vector. And if you write that out, x u cross x v, write it out in coordinates, crank out that cross product in coordinates, that capital N vector ends up being this. Now, very quickly, let me remind you, um, when you compute a cross product, right? cross products are computed with little determinants, a 3x3 three three determinant, symbolic 3x3 three three determinant, which ends up coming up with a bunch of little 2x2 two two determinants along the way, and we have this notation to represent those corresponding 2x2 two two determinants. Now, I think it's a healthy exercise for everyone to do this on your own. Please do crank this out. Write it, you know, crank out this cross product. Use that notation and confirm that that is indeed what you get. And everybody should do this once in their lives. All right. Having done that, we've taken our capital N vector. We've written it in coordinates. Now let's stick it back in there and see what happens. And well, here it is. You can there your capital N vector. There are its coordinates, and multiplying by du dv, just like we did um, previously, gives us our ds vector. And there then is a formula for our ds vector. Now, uh, the, right, just writing ds vectors really convenient, very compact. Right? But if you were to stretch out your ds vector into coordinates, this is what you would get. And I, uh, I think it's cool to point out that uh, notice just like here where we found ourselves with an urge to cancel the dts, right? Likewise, we kind of have an urge here. Oh, where, whoa, where did it go? Yeah, here we go. Kind of have an urge here to cancel the du dvs kind of sort of right flashbacks to change of variables in some sense the whole point of this notation uh, here is so that you can do that cancellation and it'll always it, you know it's kind of nonsense right but uh, it's nonsense that will always get you to the right thing so anyway um, so um, now, does that make sense? This is, this is notation and all, but is there actually are are we is there a change of variables here? Are we actually looking at y and z as functions of u and v? Um, and I want to point out that yes, in fact, we are. We are looking at y and z as functions of u and v uh, in our parameters. Where did I draw this picture? Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, 
When you parameterize your surface in the first place, there's a parametric surface, right? We have x, y, and z, functions of u and v. That's what a parameterization is. Um, and among other things, pick any two of these. Let's take x and y, by the way, just because it's a little easier to see. Um, x and y are functions of u and v. It's just that z is also, and I'm trying to, you know, for the purposes of understanding x and y as functions of u and v, let me kind of ignore the z. And now geometrically, what does it mean to throw away the z coordinate? Throwing away the z coordinate means we're going to look at the projection down into the xy plane. Right, so we're going to have this, this area of a projection down there. Like that. And now, so you can think of that projection as being something that happens in XYZ space, or you can think of it as being a function that we apply uh, from the surface into the XY plane. Separately. Take your pick. Okay, so yeah, X and Y are functions of U and V. We literally have a change of variables function here. The change of variables function is the projection of the parameterization of the original surface. And so when we write this down, let's look at uh, that expression right there. This is a change of variables function. X and Y are functions of U and V. In the change of variables context, we know that this is a this is a, one of these you know kind of victimless crimes. It's like well you can it's, it's wrong, but it's going to get us to the right thing, and thereby it makes loads of sense um, to call this dx dy because this thing that I've got circled there, its magnitude, its absolute value is this area over here in the xy plane. The area of the change of variables, you know, image. Namely, the area of the projection down into the xy plane. So this is the really nice result, um, is that this is how you can think of uh, the uh, these coordinates. Uh, when you write, where did it go? Yeah, when you write the ds vector in coordinates this represents the area of the projection of the surface into the xy plane and analogy and the details for you all to check on your own this represents the area of the projection into the yz plane and this represents the uh, in magnitude represents the area of the projection of the piece of surface into the zx Okay. All right. So, uh, lots to say about this geometrically. That it's all in the book here, and I encourage you to read it. We don't quite have time, um, but uh, it makes loads of sense then uh, to define these things, just like we did on the previous page, and thereby um, uh, our ds vector. That we wrote out in coordinates to get this. Our ds vector is just that. So we have an alternative coordinate notation now for our vector differential ds. Okay, and so again, uh, you now let's keep play, you know keep stretching this out. What that means is, you know, with our vector field, we know how to write our vector field in coordinates pqr. We now have a way to write our um, our ds vector in coordinates. Our ds vector is dx dy dz, and writing out the dot product vector field dot that vector differential gives us what we call coordinate surface integrals and I, it, so again it, just like with coordinate line integrals it's an awkward alternative notation for something that we already have a much better notation for from the math 212 point of view it's uh, it's just another way of saying vector surface integral and you know practically speaking when you see this notation what you should do is think okay all right so they're they're using the coordinate notation but look the, these three these three green integrands pq and r that's just code for um, 
for uh, what my vector field is. Um, and these differentials, uh, these three coordinate surface differentials, that's just code for saying ds. Um, and so, I, again, you know, I, I tend to encourage you when you see this notation, think this notation. And again, the, this notation over here, uh, this notation is highly physical. F represents a flow of a fluid. DS represents a piece of surface. And the dot product says I want to compute the flux of the fluid through the surface. Very physical. Right. Um, right. So again, I'm showing you for two reasons. One is sort of practical. You're going to see this. This notation's out there. It's in your future. And I don't want you to not know what to do when you see it. By the way, it's not a double integral in a in a uh, you know 4.3 kind of sense. This looks like oh, that's a, just a double integral in the yz plane. Oh no, it is not in the yz plane. This is an integral that's taking place on a surface. Right. So I want you to know to be on the lookout for this um, so you won't misinterpret it and so you won't look bad when when you are not aware of standard notation right so so that that's one reason but I'm not showing you this notation because I think it makes loads of sense to use in math 212 um, I hope that no one will choose to use this notation on exams I why would you <laughs> right it's just bulky right um, but I want to be I want you to be able to recognize it outside of this context. The other thing is, and again, just like with vector line integrals, in this context of surfaces in three-dimensional space, if you want to know what does a differential form look like, these sophisticated lofty things that that uh, have uh, very, very powerful applications in the surface context, this is what differential forms look like in, in a very natural and meaningful way. Right, so this is a glimpse into deeper waters. And, you know, again, for cultural purposes, I think that's uh, good to know. Okay. All right, so uh, enough of that. Um, I'm going to move on now to Chapter 6. Oh, let's see. We have, oh, we're good. Okay, that's great. Um, right, so Chapter 6, uh, Vector Calculus. This is my favorite part of the course. Um, it is, uh, there's, some, there's some shocking... Amazing theorems here in chapter six. Um, this is kind of like uh, you know when you do calculus, you know first thing you do is you write down derivatives and you compute derivatives, lots and lots of derivatives, and then you pose this question about, hey, how would I compute the area under the curve, or how would I compute other Riemann sums, how would I compute the work that it takes to blah blah blah, and you write down Riemann sums, and you've got derivatives. And you've got Riemann sums. These are totally separate conversations, right? And then, at some point, usually earlier than they really should, but anyway, at some point then, single variable calculus class will say, hey, by the way, check it out. There's a connection between derivatives and Riemann sums. They'll say integrals, but Riemann sums, right? The connection between these things is, oh my gosh, the fundamental theorem of calculus, you can compute integrals with derivatives just by turning the derivatives around backwards that's amazing it's a shocking mind blow how could these things be so connected look how easy then it is to compute these Riemann sums it's it's overwhelming right um, fundamental theorem of calculus is uh, is uh, just a stunning result by the way do y'all know why they call it calculus this is an interesting little historical cultural thing um, and I'm I'm not an expert on the etymology, but I'm pretty sure this is true. So the word calculus, you ever go to the dentist and they're like, oh, you got calculus all over your teeth? Maybe you're better at teeth brushing than I am. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so calculus means stone, like calcium, right? So what does this have to do to, with computing things? Um, one of the very earliest computational, air quotes, computational methods uh, way back a long time ago, back, back before, you know, uh, computers, <laughs> back before there was even a lot of civilization, um, people, farmers, shepherds and such, right, didn't know how to count. They didn't know numbers, right? Um, but they've got a bunch of sheep out there in the field, right? And they've got to keep track of it. Well, I want to make sure that I keep all my sheep and... So every evening when I bring the sheep back into the pen, 
hope that's all of them. And then every morning I let them out to go graze. What if one of them wanders off? How do I know that they aren't, you know, uh, you know, a wolf is pinching one from time to time, right? How do I know that there isn't some loss? And the way that they would keep track is they would have a little sack of stones, right? And they would every time that the sheep go out in the morning, they take their sack of stones and they pull a stone out and they put it in the bucket, right? Another sheep go, okay, stone in the bucket, right? And they don't know what 17 means, but they do know that for every stone in this bucket, there's a sheep out there that they're responsible for. And then when the sheep come back at night, right, when they're pulling the sheep back in, every time a sheep goes into the pen, they take the stone out of the bucket and they put it back in the bag, right? And then when they're done, there better not be any stones left in the bucket. And if there are, if there's stones in the bucket, this many, I don't know what that number is, right? But I'm but if there's this many stones in the bucket, then I need to go out and find this many sheep. Okay. So this is a computational tool. And it involves stones. And just, you know, my understanding is that the word um, calculate and calculus all derive from this um, this uh, this um, sort of origin. Right? So if now let's let's think about how that affects, you know, how does that uh Interpret. How do we interpret from that the name fundamental theorem of calculus? If you think about it, that is then a tremendously uh, aggressive name, <laughs> right? The fundamental theorem of calculating things, the fundamental tool of computation, right? It's a very aggressive name, right? But that's how important fundamental theorem of calculus is, and it's again how shocking it is that there are connections between Riemann sums and derivatives. Okay. So this chapter, chapter six here, we're talking about vector calculus theorems. Um, all of the theorems here in chapter, well, the, all of the big theorems, uh, a lot of the big theorems that we're going to talk about in here are multivariable versions of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So big stuff, right? This is very, very important. By the way, for those of you who are engineers, um, the... Uh, math department, myself included, went and talked to the engineering school one time and we asked them, yeah, let's just make sure we're on the same page here. What do y'all need your students to know? Right? And the response that we got was, okay, well, the most important thing is vector calculus. The second most important thing is vector calculus. <laughs> right? And they gave us this, this kind of like, you know, the most, y'all know the thing about the most important things in real estate, the most important thing to keep track of in real estate is location. Second most important thing is location. <laughs> it's an old joke. But anyway, th- the point is vector calculus is extremely important in engineering. It's highly analogous in ways that I'm going to emphasize a lot. Uh, highly analogous to the fundamental theorem of calculus. And, um, and uh, just in a sort of a multivariable and uh, a more geometrically interesting kind of way. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Bad news. I can't tell you the whole story. It, it's just way, way beyond what we can reasonably do in Math 212. Um, there's um, something called the General Stokes' Theorem. We're going to encounter some, a special case called Stokes' Curl Theorem. Uh, but th- there is a general, generalized version um, that is extremely sophisticated. So sophisticated, it wasn't really fully written down properly until the 1950s, right? I think that's shocking. Um, so th- anyway, a very sophisticated theorem. There's another uh, collection of results that, depending on how you look at them, and I, I think a, 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 uh, an ideal discussion of these other results um, would really require talking about the Durham cohomology theorem, which again is very sophisticated stuff. This is graduate level um, uh, kind of stuff and completely inaccessible to what we can do in Math 212. Um, so we can't do that. Okay. So what a lot of textbooks do instead is they say, okay, well, we have this this lofty discussion of things. Here's the line <laughs> that uh, we can, can reasonably get to in a multivariable calculus class. So we'll just chop. We'll take all this stuff that's above the line and throw it away. And just the little, just the, the manifestations down here below the line, we'll just talk about those. And that's it. And 
that's all you see. Well, this is, I think, a real tragedy uh, because even though we can't talk about the General Stokes' theorem fully, there are some patterns that you can notice about how stuff fits together if you understand the General Stokes' theorem. Um, and even though I can't talk about the theorem itself, I mean, not even close, right? I can talk about the patterns. Right? I can, and likewise, with Durham cohomology, I can't tell you the whole story there. Oh, no, right? But I can cut out the, the formalities and the rigor and the, the most of the work, right? And I can just show you the patterns of, you know, what's actually kind of, what's the pattern of the results as opposed to just the results. So that's what I'm going to try to do uh, in this class. Um, uh, I'm going to emphasize the analogies that come about because of the fact that we're talking about one theorem here. Um, and I'm going to create a structure that's going to seem very arbitrary. And I can't justify the structure that I'm going to write down because... This I write this structure down because that's what uh, that's what chain and cochain complexes that lead to Durham cohomology look like, and so I can't. No, 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 I'm not going to be able to give you those reasons, but I'm going to write down the structure nevertheless. And the promise is is that if you follow the pattern that I give you, right, then everything's just going to fit together in this wonderfully convenient way for reasons that you'll not quite understand. <laughs> <laughs> that we can't deal with, but you can still benefit from seeing the patterns and how the, the dovetails fits together in this beautiful way. Okay, so so that's what I'm going to try to do uh, in uh, writing the book. And so it, here begins now a, a long list of arbitrary choices and conventions that I'm going to make and not justify with that in mind. All right, so, so here we go. Um, let's talk about single variable calculus for a moment. Here's the objects... Uh, what I'm going to call the domains um, for calculations of things in single variable calculus. We compute integrals on intervals. Right? Integral from A to B. Right? The domain there is an interval. Uh, but there's another kind of calculation that we can do, a uh, different sort of a calculation. If you give me a function and you want to get a number to come out, I could just stick in some point. Right? So notice, if you give me a function... I could uh, plug in this point to get a to get a number, or I could do an integral over this domain to get a number. Okay. So these are what I'm going to call uh, the domains of interest in Calc One. Uh, then, uh, likewise, in Calc Two, um, excuse me, in uh, <laughs> sorry, in uh, in two dimensions, right? Calc Three. This stuff. Um, we have points. We have curves on which we can do integrals. We have regions on which we can do integrals. Okay. In Calc 3, we have points and curves and surfaces and solids. Right? We have more players in Calc 3 these different kinds of domains. And for each one of these, and there are different ways, if you give me the right kind of, what I'm going to call integrand, function, whatever it is, give me the right kind of integrand, I can um, do the appropriate calculation over the appropriate one of these domains, and out comes a number. Okay. All right. Now, uh, what kinds of calculations do we do here? Uh, most of these are obvious. Um, on an interval, you do a calc 1 integral. Um, uh, on a point, you plug the point into the function. Um, on a domain like this, on a two-dimensional region in R2, you do a double integral. The, the, what else would you do? Right, these, are, these are the kinds of calculations that we're going to focus on and talk about. Um, delicate point, though, here. What kind of calculation do we do on a curve in R2? We actually have two calculations that we do on curves in R2. We have scalar line integrals. And we have vector line integrals. Now here comes the arbitrary choice. Here, and again, you just have to take my word for it. But the way that the big theorems manifest and make wonderful things fit together down here in Math 212 is by way of thinking about vector line integrals on these curves. Forget scalar line integrals in this context. That's just not what 
differential forms look like, and it's just not how stuff fits together. So you have to just take my word for it. So when we're talking about a curve, we're going to be thinking about vector line integrals on that curve. Um, likewise in R3, vector line integrals. On surfaces, vector surface integrals. Forget scalar surface integrals. It's just not, it's not going to be part of the conversation. We're going to be looking at vector surface integrals. Okay. And then again, all the expected stuff, triple integrals on solids, etc. Okay. So those are the players in our little game, uh, in the story that we're going to be telling, where everything's going to mysteriously fit together in just the right way, if you arrange things just the right way. Okay. Okay. So now I want to talk about orientations. We already have. Y'all know what orientations are in a couple of contexts. What do I mean by orientation on a curve? An orientation says which way are you going. Now let me actually write down your options. On uh, well, let's just let's do this on a curve like this. Your orientation is, well, it's either that or that. These are your choices for orientations on a curve, right? There's two different ways you can go along the curve. Yeah. You could want to know how much work it takes to go along the curve from start to finish, you know, from bottom to top, as I have it drawn here, or you could want to know the amount of work it takes to go from top to bottom. Separate calculations. And notice they're exact negatives of each other, right? And you can think, see that two different ways at any given point. Um, here, let me do it like this. Uh, at any given point, you've got two different directions that you can go, and they're exact negatives of each other. The resulting line integrals are exact negatives of each other. Okay, um, ditto with flux. Uh, let's look at a surface here. Uh, on a surface, here's your two different um, your two different possible orientations. At that point, you have a one or the other. Your orientation is either that or this. Um, <coughs> they're negatives of each other. They give rise to fluxes that are exact negatives of each other. We talked about that before. Okay, so the, so the way we think about orientations then, uh, you know, on a curve or on a surface, we think about orientations in a geometric way. We think of them as, well, here's your two possibilities. Um, and the two possibilities are geometric things. Um, I just want to shift our point of view on that a little bit. Uh, in order to be able to extend this idea. Um, but uh, instead of thinking of orientations geometrically, I would like to think about orientations algebraically. It's going to seem a little weird, okay? But what we're going to do is we're going to say, look, there's, there are two different possible choices of orientation, and they are negatives of each other. Uh, they're, they're, they're conventions that have to do with, with uh, which way does a minus sign go, and thus the definition... Uh, that I'm going to write down uh, down here. Again, this is not rigorous. This is not this is not technically right. Okay, but an orientation is a convention regarding sign in terms of how you're computing integrals or whatever on that context. Convention regarding sign. Okay, so up here in when you're talking about line integrals and surface integrals, you can make that convention in a geometric way. On a, on a solid, you can't, right? I can't talk about a geometric notion of, of, uh, you know, on a, if I were doing a triple integral, what would be the positive orientation? What would be the, what would be the negative orientation? That geometrically doesn't make any sense. But what I can do still is I can make a convention. It's gonna seem arbitrary, but I can make a convention regarding sign in how I do evaluations and the, the, Choices are going to be, uh, whoops, the choices will be uh, plus <laughs> uh, and minus. 
right? Those are the two, um, uh, what I'm going to call uh, available orientations that I can have for a solid three-dimensional shape. And it's not geometric. I can't draw a picture. There's no arrow pointing in a positive direction or anything like that, right? Nevertheless, just like within the geometric orientations on curves and surfaces, it's a convention. You could give one or the other, and the difference is, is that these two conventions are negatives of each other. So... Anyway, it's going to seem a little weird, but um, I need to have this uh, this pattern. I need to be able to say, you know, plus. I need to have positive orientation and negative orientation. I need to be able to choose one or the other um, on all of the domains uh, that I have here. And uh, so, you know, likewise um, on regions, right? On on intervals. I need to, there's going to be a notion of a negatively oriented interval, and it's just an algebraic convention. Okay. All right. Um, so what I mean by uh, you know a, a negative orientation or a positive orientation, let's say for example, I'm looking on a uh, on a region in R2. Oh, wrong color. On a region in R2. Right. So two-dimensional region in R2. What I mean by a positive orientation on that domain is just do the integral. And then when you're done, multiply by positive 1. In other words, just do the integral. And what I mean by a negative orientation, arbitrary though this may seem, and it's totally arbitrary, but a negatively oriented domain for a double integral, all I mean is just do the integral. And then when you're done, multiply by negative one. So um, we now have conventions regarding signs and how you do integrals um, on two-dimensional domains. It's an orientation. It's a convention regarding sign in uh, doing evaluations on that kind of domain. Okay, so likewise for all of our other domains. Uh, so now I'm going to insist that going forward, all of these kinds of domains, we have e e on each one, there could be a one orientation or there could be the other orientation. Uh, now, you all have to keep track of what your options are. On curves, your options are geometric. And you all have to keep that in mind. There's no such thing as a positive orientation on a curve. That's not how the orientations work. On curves, your orientation is either one way or it's another way. It's a geometric thing. Okay. Um, likewise on surfaces. There's no intrinsically positive orientation. There's just one way versus another way. Um, on solids, there's no geometric notion of orientation. There's just plus and minus and likewise on intervals and on uh, two-dimensional regions. And by the way, on points, you can have a negatively oriented point or a positively oriented point. And in all cases, an algebraic orientation just means a minus sign. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Enough of that. Uh, and then uh, real quick, and then we'll have to call it a day. Um, if you have a curve, and I... Oh, gosh, I better zoom in here. You have a curve, and you're doing a line integral over that curve. You could ask, "What about the negative of the orientation on that curve?" Now, now remember, on curves, orientations are geometric, right? So I'm not saying that C is negatively oriented. C is just oriented geometrically in some way. Maybe C is oriented like this. When I write minus C, I just mean do the opposite of whatever the orientation on C is. So um, as a result, since this curve and that curve are, ori are the exact same curve, just oriented in opposite directions, the values of those resulting oriented integrals will be negatives of each other. So heads up, you're going to see this kind of thing. We're going to see plus and minus signs on orientations, um, and you just interpret them like this. Okay, that's a good stopping point. Uh, we will pick up here uh, next time. See you all later.